a biscuit, <laughs> a very old biscuit, turned to rock, as a matter of fact, uh, a hammerstone that was just picked up this week. And we're going to talk about some of these things. What I want to do today is, um, and just hang in there with me, uh, we're getting into the spring season now, we're front part of April in Ohio, people are getting ready to take to the fields. Um, I'm getting people calling and asking questions. I'm getting emails. And uh, so I thought it'd be good just to take a minute, uh, clear up a few things, tie some loose ends, and then give some pointers for getting out and getting ready. Uh, so uh, hang in there. <laughs> so let's do this. One of the questions that came up several times is on this little marker over here. And, uh, and just a lot of confusion, and I'm sorry for that. But I get confused too. Please, please, please remember that I am not the final source. I'm just one of many. We've got a lot of years in the field, just like you, done a ton of reading, had some classes, and I bring my best, the best I have to you. And even there, you're going to have to weed through it and run it past other people who may know more or have a different opinion, and that's all good. So what I did is, I wanted to talk about rollover versus overshots again. And then when I was thinking about overshots, I thought, you know what, there's an overshot and there's a straight shot. <laughs> oh man. But a rollover is working with a biface, and it's from lateral side, it's a strike on the lateral side, goes over, rounds up, comes back on the other side, and it breaks somewhere. Usually it destroys the piece. It thins it down to where they can't use it. Um, so uh, working with a biface, usually a thinning flake where they're trying to reduce the face, make it thinner like that. And it's from lateral side to lateral side. Now there's some disagreement. Some people will have a different name for this. But in my part of Ohio, most of my flint nappers and a lot of people tend to call this uh, the true rollover. Uh, and it's okay to have a difference of opinion. Then slipping over here, we're looking at a overshot, which is on a uniface piece. Now remember, that means worked on one side and not the other side. So we're looking now at an overshot. And I put some little notes with these. One of the cool things about an overshot, and I think we can all agree on this, even if we call it a different name, we can all agree that you get a lip right along here. The energy goes and it rolls partially over or all the way over, but you get a lip, and that creates a strong working platform right here. And so sometimes you'll get modifications. You'll get a burn where they took a blade off here or here or even here, or you'll see where they put a partial scraper right here or a partial knife or a full end scraper. Either way, they recognized that this created a very strong working platform and it's so significant and, uh, that we felt this needs to be pulled out and considered as a separate tool. Whether they got it out of their debutage pile or not, we're finding it on sites. And it's nine times out of ten, it's not just a pure uh, overshot. It's an overshot that's been reworked a little bit. Um, now, the overshot versus a straight overshot. A straight overshot is striking the uh, basal end going down and the energy is going straight out the other side, straight out the other side, a straight shot, where the overshot is coming up and, and the energy just curls and creates this little lip along here. So overshot, rollover, rollovers are on biface. It's from lateral side to lateral side. And it's usually a size or a thickness reduction across one of the faces like that. Usually this ends up in the destruction of the piece. Over here, with the overshot, um, it, I think it was just something that was in their debitage pile. They picked it up. They knew they had a good tool. And from there, they finished the tool. So we get a uniface overshot, creates the lip. Uh, and right here, we're looking at the ventral side. So reminders, I hope this clarifies some things for you folks. Gives you some food for thought. And uh, I'm going to give you a couple real quick uh, uh, overshots. These were found this week. We were out walking, 
And, uh, and here we go. So here's your uh, basal end, distal end. This is a uh, uniface piece. And it comes up and it rolls, has a little bit of a lip formed right here. And this broke from there using it, and they reworked it into another tool and had another tool coming down the side. If I flip him over, you can see there's damage, use damage over here where they were really bearing down and working on this thing. And even that, there's repair areas where they could get an engraver. Uh, so overshot. Here's another overshot. Now, this one's a little bit more interesting. We, you can see the lip forming, but then it ends, and this is a fracture. So this is an overshot, uh, uh, just a, a fractured piece where it broke. And uh, some of them have a perfect little lip, and some of them fracture out just like that. Either way, these are both uh, uh, pieces that were currently found, and we call them overshots. All right. It's time to get walking, <laughs> and uh, I put a little thing together, a little bit of reminders, and I'm going to talk to you about some of those. This was one thing that came up several times. The other thing that came up that you guys don't know about were some discussions about chert and flint. I think the real technical geologist, combo archaeologist, is calling the, the material that we find chert, and with the real flint, being found in the UK, over into Denmark, Netherlands, and some of Europe. Uh, again, we're getting really technical, and I think it's okay to stick with your colloquialisms. Hey, it's just what we call it in Ohio. We call it flint. But, but there is a difference between flint and chert. All right. Uh, <laughs> somebody called me out on one of my, on one of my uh, walks. And it was my summer walk in that crazy flint field. They said, you're wearing sunglasses. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I'm wearing these. These are tinted, um, and they just protect your eyes. They're not sunglasses. They, they're like a polar rays. But, but if I had my polar sunglasses on, my eyes would be black right now. But anyway, those help me. Uh, and I, I've said this a lot, but I'm going to repeat it. It's very, very worthwhile repeating, and that is wearing ball caps. Um, it's functional. You know, for you gals, um, it hides your hair, and this is not, I'm sorry, it's not a safe time anymore to live, and it doesn't matter where you are, things can happen, and if you're out in the field by yourself, things can happen. Um, I hope they don't. Uh, carry a 45, no, <laughs> Uh, wear a ball cap. Get your hair up under your ball cap when you're walking uh, so that people won't know that, uh, that you're a gal. Just be smart. Be wise. Um, also, with a ball cap, it protects your eyes. Your pupils are able to open up a little bit, and you can see more of the ground, and you can get a better view of what's going on. Um, if it's a cloud-covered day, you don't need the ball cap. Uh, always, always hydrate. You know, even if you take a little small water bottle, put it in your back pocket or a bigger one, and you put it in your camo bucket that you're carrying with you out to the field, take water, hydrate. Last year, I had, after all my years of walking, I ran into a situation where I was in trouble. Um, I had not hydrated. I was out of water. It was 92 degrees, and I did this. Well, I'm just going to do one more down and back. Oh, I got a lot of stuff. Well, maybe one more down and back. So five down and backs later, I was barely able to get to the edge of the field, and it was a, a move up to get to the road. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get up. I just laid there. And I thought about my cell phone in the car. Uh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Stuff happens as you get older. Stuff happens. Um, I had to lay there for a while to really seriously recoup enough energy to get up that embankment and then get over to my car. Uh, my last YouTube that went up, <laughs> some of you said, hey, you made a mistake. You said it was 23. No, we didn't make a mistake. It was filmed, opening this site up in 23. We actually shot uh, more than one video of opening that site and from different thoughts, different directions, 
different things that were going on. And we looked at it, and my videographer said, hey, look, we've got a really good video that we really could use. Let's get it out there, um, because it's going to show you, let you see maybe a different aspect of our dig site. And uh, if you can hear that voice out there calling, come dig, <laughs> we're going to be down on that dig site real soon. So, um, all right, equipment. Uh, man, I can't say enough. And the reason I say a trout, and I brought one, it's a mason trout. It's the smaller type mason trout. It's more conducive to getting out of the field. You can slip this in your back pocket. You don't have to carry it with you all the time. But if you're going to dig stones out, this is better than a screwdriver. It's better than a golf club, and it's better than a long bamboo pole. Trowel, a small mason trowel. I can't say enough about it. Plus, when you go in the ground, if you're getting a lot of chips, you may want to just tap the ground a lot and see if there's more buried there. Caches of blades all the time. A lot of great things that you can use this for to help you in the field. Um, Ziplocs. I've used Ziplocs for probably 50 years, but I don't use regular Ziplocs. I use um, freezer Ziplocs because things happen. You can bang them against each other, your leg or whatever, and the regular ones can rip. And you can lose uh, some really great stuff. So uh, get the uh, get the Ziplocs. In my area, we use one-gallon bags, and uh, that's because we come out of the field with several one-gallon bags in that uh, five-gallon bucket. So uh, then I had, uh, on one of our videos, you saw this. You saw pieces that were here laying on the table like that. Well, they were in the process of getting to this stage where the piece was in here, information was written on the little slip. Why do I do that? I started doing that a little bit. Two years ago, last year, um, I'm getting the hiccups, you guys, so <laughs> you have to look past those. <laughs> so uh, last year I started to do it with some intent, and this year I'm doing it a lot. Because you get a really nicely broken piece or a little uh, interesting uh, spoke shaver that's broken, by putting them in these little bags, it's going to reduce, seriously reduce, the uh, possibilities of them getting dinged or po uh, points or areas broken off. It's just good maintenance. I like it, and I'm starting to do it more and more, and that's why I do it. <clears throat> these two pieces were in a frame. Otherwise, they would be in bigger little Ziplocs, just like that. And if you notice, in here, you see a 3 by 5 card cut and reduced with no lines on it. And if there is going to be writing on it, it's going to be one of two things. It'll either be my Sharpie or it'll be a pencil. Uh, because these things, humidity can get in there and ink will run. It'll do, smear on its own and you can lose everything that you have written on this. I recommend pencil. I also recommend any bag, everything you have always has a label. IDs, on your ID, location, uh, Richland County, uh, and then if you want to put the township, that's fine. Uh, put your name or your initials, and probably not a bad idea to put the date. Um, and I'm talking about all bags, all boxes, all filing cabinet. Everything needs to have labels. And not only that, you need to keep a Sharpie in your vehicle. So when you get done walking, you put your uh, Ziplocs in the car right away. Put 1622 get it on there and then I'm also I'll even double it up I'll put 1622 in the bag and then I'll write on the outside of the bag I'm telling you what you people are all brilliant but we still forget <laughs> so do it um, then the other thing at home is a ledger keep keep your field notes it's really important your site and information on the site the landowner his name uh, his phone number address draw a little map of the farm uh, take a photo, put the photo in there, and mark where your, uh, your individual sites are, okay? Uh, just some things to think about. Uh, right now, we've got turkey seasons going on. It may not mean a whole lot to you, but it means a lot to hunters when they're out there. So make yourself identifiable, blaze orange, but otherwise, camo uh, top, maybe a camo shirt, 
and just look like your background so you're not obvious. That's why that's not a white bucket. It's a camo bucket. Uh, cleaning your artifacts. Uh, basically, soft brushes. If you've got slate and it's got a hole, leave. And it's a whole piece or a good piece. Uh, leave the dirt in the hole until you talk to someone that knows their stuff. Um, and uh, basically, that uh, is just a real quick overview. I want to get you out in the field. I want to give you some reminders, just some things to think about. Remember to label, 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 and uh, we're going to get into a field and show you what came out of it very recently. So <laughs> thank you for another very short, long <laughs> video. We'll see you soon, everybody.